Dios. People always ask me how this happened. What made it spread? What made it grow? People ask, how do I start something big? I usually smile and tell them I don't know. Because to write Love on Her Arm started about as small as something could. It was a story and an attempt to help one person. It was a MySpace page. It was a box of t-shirts, and one of those shirts ended up on stage at a Switchfoot show in South Florida on March 30th, 2006. We never could have guessed what it all would lead to. Now, our Friday Making a Difference report. Growing up can be tough, and too many young people are struggling with depression, addiction, even thoughts of suicide. And perhaps the biggest obstacle, the feeling of being in it all alone. Twerkowski started an organization to write love on her arms. Funded mainly through the sale of T-shirts, the group's MySpace, Facebook, and Twitter responses number in the hundreds of thousands. Somewhere in the equation of helping young people in despair is not just getting them the information, but telling them in some way, I hear you, I see you, yeah, I'm I, with you. I think hopefully there's an element of caring for this person, that they, they feel heard. I think we never know what can save a life, but, but I think it's important that we go there and that we try. Renee's story was told in a way that was honest, and I suppose it gave people permission to be honest about their story, about their struggles, their questions and their pain. A common thread began to emerge. It was people saying, this is something no one knows. This is something I've never said out loud. And so there was this feeling that people were taking a step forward. And for a lot of people, it was the very first step. Folks began to realize that they were not alone. Other people were dealing with the same things they were. Someone else had been where they were. Someone else was there right now. To write Love on Her Arms became something like a bridge. The goal was to move people from a place of shame and isolation to community and from hopelessness to hope. More than anything, the goal was for people to get the help they needed and deserved. And so ever since then, we've been pointing to professional help. We've given $1.6 million to it. We point to counseling, treatment centers, crisis hotlines, and support groups. We've learned that two out of three people who struggle with depression, they never get help for it. It's because of stigma. People feel like they can't talk about this stuff. We feel ashamed and feel alone. We're afraid of being misunderstood. We're afraid of being labeled and judged. But over the last 10 years, we've seen thousands of lives begin to change. We hear from folks who are sitting across from a counselor for the first time and people stepping into treatment, or someone who, in a desperate moment, they sent a text to Crisis Text Line or called 1-800-273-TALK. These are people literally choosing to stay alive. We've seen some incredible doors open, things we could not have even imagined. recipient of the one million dollar grant is to write love on her arms. And it's our belief that your story is sacred and it's priceless and it's entirely unique and no one else can play your part. It's our hope that you will never ever give up. I think the 100 countries is impressive, and then Amber has 195 countries, <laughs> and we got like half the countries, you know? 
uh, and then keeping keeping that going, uh, I do want to mention I'm the same person that was in the video. <laughs> so that was like a decade of highlights and haircuts, and uh, and then for the last couple of years, it's it's been more of this haircut and and just showing the video and just living in the glory days. Uh, I like I have I don't think it's a speaking hack, but I have figured out there's something that that helps me get comfortable when I end up on a stage uh, is just to tell a fun story that that may or may not have a lot to do or anything to do with what I'm going to talk about, but it's like something that happened recently. And so I want to tell a fun story. And this actually does relate to me preparing for this talk. Uh, first off, I'm so honored to be here. I, I totally feel feel what Amber shared, uh, just honored to be in the room. Jeff has been a friend and, and I'm a fan of, of his work and to get to see you know, what this community has become and to get to be here and, and celebrate 10 years uh, means a lot. I was really honored to get the invite. And these guys were so wonderful. Uh, Jeff and, and Kayla were, were just keeping me informed and, and then I realized they needed some information from me that I had not provided and so they were emailing me and I had not written back and and you know we live in a day where when someone doesn't email you send a text uh, so Kayla politely texts me and says hey we need your flight information and in this moment I'm uh, walking my puppy in front of the Starbucks that I go to every morning in Florida in India Atlantic Florida and uh, I, I quickly respond because I feel bad I, I I hit her back with my flight information. Uh, and and I've, we're going to show my daughter on the screen. That's Gracie. Uh, I am not obsessed with her, but she'll be seven months old tomorrow. <laughs> so she's my best buddy, and, and I'm still learning. Uh, I've, I've had her. I'm coming up on four months that I've had her, and it's been amazing. But I'm still learning. And, and so there were things I, I thought were kind of like broad stroke suggestions. And again, I, I go to Starbucks every morning. And I, because I know them and they know me, they let me bring her in. She's not supposed to be there, but I, I get to bring her in. And sort of the unspoken, you know, simple rule is your dog should not go to the bathroom in this Starbucks. And so without too much information, Gracie, Gracie has gone number one this morning and has not yet gone number two. Kayla's text arrives. I write her back, walk Gracie for a couple minutes, and I just decide she doesn't have to go. I have tried, and she doesn't need to go this morning. And so we take two steps into Starbucks, and I see her go into the squat. And I quickly pick her up. And I'm like mortified and I, I turn around and walk back out and I think, okay, that was close. And a really kind man comes out of the Starbucks and says, hey, I, you didn't realize. And he informs me that she was not starting but finishing. And, and so now it's just like a crisis and I have to like go back in and clean up. It's like right in the front door. The place is packed. Everyone's looking at me like I'm a terrible puppy dad. And then to bring this back to this event, I start hearing my name over and over again. I hear, Jamie, 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 where are you? I realize it's Jeff Schinnebarger's voice, and I have FaceTimed Kayla <laughs> in the midst of this puppy crisis. So I'm like holding her, cleaning up. I just hang up on them, you know? I think I wrote her back a couple of minutes like, you know, just some combination of words, just like puppy, Starbucks, potty, crisis. <laughs> uh, and that, that, that's my fun story. That's me getting comfortable. Uh, it's, Amber has set the bar really high. Uh, and prior to that, Jeff and I had a call and, and you know, just kind of doing the homework to, and I, I just said, Jeff, you know, how can I serve this community, what could I talk about at this event? And I threw out some things that I didn't think would, you know, there were probably things I didn't want to talk about. And I kept noticing everything I didn't want to talk about, basically because it was hard, it was vulnerable, it was kind of the opposite of the highlight reel, was stuff that he basically said, yeah, you should, you should just talk about that. Uh, 
Jeff and I have a mutual friend, a, a guy who probably a lot of you are familiar with, uh, a guy named Mike Foster. And Mike is a, a writer and a speaker, and Mike has a podcast with a very misleading name. It's called Fun Therapy. And I was lucky enough to be a guest on Fun Therapy, and I, I, sat, I went to Mike's house in California, and I sat down, and, and I think this is kind of off the record. We're just, you know, getting started. And he literally asks me, what don't you want to talk about? And I very sincerely list a couple things, and I realize we are off and running, we are recording, and we will now talk only about the things that I did not want to talk about. Uh, and I feel like this, this talk, I relate to Amber, she's a lot more polished and, and had great slides and great art and cool handwriting, great voices as well. I really like the British girl. Uh, but it feels kind of the same way where I, I've gotten really comfortable with this talk that I kind of give over and over and tweak uh, and, and kind, of, kind of threw that out for today just based on that conversation with Jeff. And before I get to that, Part, which is really just going to be me trying to be honest about my own journey as, as a leader, as someone who struggles with depression, as someone who founded an organization uh, 13 years ago, and, and as you saw in that video, just really changed the course of my life and, and has been filled with so many surprising open doors and highlights and bright moments. Uh, but then, of course, there, there are other parts of the story as well. Uh, but... Prior to that, I want to share uh, some things. This, this is sort of like the, before we get to the hard stuff, I want to share some, some easy stuff that, that I think can be uh, hopefully informative and encouraging for you guys, for this audience, knowing that there are people in the room that have started, are starting, want to start organizations, companies, brands, charities, movements, uh, want to do good. And so this is something that, uh, I've kind of gathered up in, in recent months, and it's been cool to be able to talk about it. So just some things, you know, people, a lot of people ask just, and it makes sense, people just kind of say, how, how, how did this happen? Like, how did you try to help one person? How did you try to, to sell a box of t-shirts? You made a MySpace page. I feel like I'm in a safe place to talk about MySpace with just with you guys. I, I sometimes speak at high schools and I'm, I'm just so afraid of the day where it's just silent because they don't know what that word means, you know? Uh, but you guys were there, you lived it. Uh, so just, just things, hang on, sorry. Just, I think, 10 things that we've done well and I'll just kind of fly through these and uh, they may not all apply, but my hope is that a few of these might spark some ideas or just be things that are encouraging for you. Uh, the first would be individual people and stories. For those of you who know a little bit about the organization or even if you only saw the video, it started as the attempt to tell one story and to invest in the life and story of one person. And so I love to point out that we couldn't have had a, a smaller or simpler beginning in terms of not attempting to start a charity or a nonprofit, but only trying to help one person and trying to tell one story. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice that came very early on back in 2006, as we started to grow, as our story started to get out there, as uh, we started to hear from more and more people in, in different places, a friend pulled me aside and he just said, hey, no matter how big this thing gets, it will always be made up of individuals. And so now if our Facebook is, is at 1.5 million likes, I get to reflect on my friend's advice and just realize that's 1.5 million individuals. So not to get lost in the bigness or the masses or the totals, the way the numbers add up, but to constantly be thinking about how do we bring encouragement, how do we bring hope, resources, some kind of value to one person, to all of these individual one persons on the other side of that computer screen or at the events that we get to be a part of. We started with a story and language has been a value, good writing has been a value ever since. Most of the t-shirts the that we make, actually I'm wearing one that's a bit of an exception 
most of everything we do, whether it's Instagram, T-shirts, our own website campaigns, it's just built around words. It's built around statements, and pretty much everything we do is an attempt to move people. This one does have a few words. It just says, people need other people, and, and that'll kind of relate to the back half of what I'm going to talk about. But just good writing, even things as simple as a tweet, an Instagram caption, a blog that goes up. We're just constantly thinking about how can we use language to move people. Good design as well. Uh, I came, my job prior to starting the organization, I was a sales rep for the brand Hurley. And I grew up wearing t-shirts, loving t-shirts, went on to sell t-shirts. I worked at Quicksilver prior to Hurley. And I had this kind of simple idea that if, if I wanted to sell some t-shirts to help pay for my friend to get through treatment, if we made a cool t-shirt, we would probably sell more, right? Just really brilliant stuff coming at you this morning. Uh, and I feel like we have so many peers that have done design so incredibly well in, in the realm of doing good or even, even as charities. You look at Charity Water, uh, we came up around the same time as Invisible Children. Uh, clearly, Amber was someone who values design, creativity, art. And so going back to that very first t-shirt, I think we've just tried to figure out how can we also use design to move people. And I'm kind of preaching to the choir. We're in this beautiful space. You guys are super hip and cool. We can move on. Uh, the power of social media. Again, we, we giggle when we hear MySpace, but what I try to offer the young people that I talk to is the idea that you might laugh about MySpace, but that was the beginning of kind of the world that these folks have grown up in, where social media just became part of everyday life. And I'm thankful I was willing to go down with the ship. Like, I just thought, MySpace is here to stay forever. And someone on our team was smart enough to start to copy and paste things onto something called Facebook while I was still you know, living the MySpace dream. And just, you know, over a decade plus, we've been able to make these various transitions and think about these different platforms and how can we use these platforms to bring hope and help to people. Uh, T-shirts have been such an important part of what we do. And especially in the early years, it was our primary source of income. But I love going back to the very beginning, there was this this hope or this possibility that a t-shirt could be more than a t-shirt. And it wasn't honestly this strategic thing, but something we've loved throughout our whole existence has just been hearing the stories of the conversations that are started where someone, maybe it's two strangers in an airport and someone says, hey, I like your shirt, what does that mean? And the cool thing that happens is not just that they get to tell the story of this organization, but hopefully that it creates a vehicle or a moment where they can tell part of their own story, maybe even a vulnerable part of their story. They can talk about a loved one who was lost to suicide. They could talk about uh, mental health and why it matters and maybe how they've been affected by this. And so I love the idea of thinking about, for you, maybe it's not a t-shirt, but just how can this be more than what it seems at first glance? Uh, influence. We've been really fortunate. You saw some of those people. I, I was in a video with Joaquin Phoenix and Miley Cyrus. That is an unusual situation to be in, right? Uh, we've made videos that we put so much work into that we were so proud of, and 5,000 people watched it. But we found if you make a video with Joaquin Phoenix and Miley Cyrus, it will be the most popular video on YouTube the following day, right? So there's just this, this reality of, of, wow, influence is this incredible thing. Uh, and if, if there are people who have it and they want to be generous, that's, that's incredible. But it's also felt important for us to point out that every single person we interact with, every person we hear from, no matter how young or old, no matter how much money they have or don't have, that we all have some kind of influence, that we're all connected to some other people, even if it's just a high school student uh, sitting with their friends at lunch or someone who works in a coffee shop and, and they want to share, they want to talk about whatever it is that they're passionate about. Talked about the need to evolve, uh, just the need to keep thinking about not just 
what matters today, but what's next? What's the next thing coming? How can we use this for good? How can we use this to communicate? Uh, and this, I think, might be my favorite, my favorite of these values, or, or definitely one of my favorites. Something that's become really a signature and a, a priority for us is just thinking about on any given day, at any given time, who are the people who are left out? And I think our best example would be holidays. And it's just become something uh, that's become very normal and important for us. And to give an example, Mother's Day, right? Mother's Day in the context of social media, uh, we're all used to, we see so many people post photos, post tributes to their mom. Right, and there's nothing wrong with that. We see, we see Mother's Day; it's a day to celebrate your mother, and the, kind of the whole world or the whole country kind of go through the motions of of doing this. I, I post a picture of mom. I celebrate my mom, and we on those days we we really try to think about who's having a hard day today. Who doesn't have a photo to post? Who has a broken relationship? Who lost their mother? Who dreams of having children and hasn't been able to yet? Who was abused by their mother? And thinking about Mother's Day, Father's Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, just trying to think about who doesn't have a seat at the table, who doesn't feel like they belong, and how can we speak to them? How can we not say and do what everyone else is doing? And it's not to stand against it, but how can we acknowledge the people who are hurting and maybe feeling invisible or alone. The other is, is uh, responding to crisis. And obviously we can't respond to every single thing that happens, but there are moments when there are headlines, when there are tragedies, and when the whole world is kind of saying, wow, that's so sad, or thoughts and prayers, we want to be able to do more. We want to offer strength, we want to offer hope, we want to offer comfort. We want to offer steps that people can take. And so it's become a value of ours to realize it's not enough to simply be sad or to say, wow, that's really sad. But we want to speak up in those moments. We want to try to lead in those moments. Uh, we've seen organizations come and go since we started. We've seen bands come and go. Uh, and I think we've, we've just tried to learn to, to be careful to kind of live in that tension of being careful, being humble, uh, but also being willing to dream and to be bold at the same time. Jeff showed me their new space, Plywood's new space, a, a few minutes ago this morning, and, and I told him we're 13 years in, and we were just able to buy a building in Florida, and it's the first time we've had an office that we were remotely proud of. For, for a long time, our interns would show up, and it was sort of like, oh, I thought you guys were cool. This place kind of sucks. And there's an element of humility and, and stewardship that, that I'm okay with, but I, I think it really, it really is a picture of we've just tried to be slow and steady. People love to ask, hey, would you ever open an office in Barcelona? And it's like, yeah, that sounds really sexy, but we're going to try to pay for the one in Florida with our little team right now, you know? So just the idea that we can't do everything and just remember the goal is to move people. With everything we do as an organization, the biggest thing we do is communicate. The biggest thing we do is try to move people. And with the time I have left, I just, I just wanna be honest. Like, those are the things we've done well. The video I showed you is the highlight reel. Uh, and I think what Jeff encouraged me to talk about was just, what about the hard stuff? Like, what about the growing pains? Uh, what about the things I'm not good at as a leader? I really stumbled into all of this. I am a college dropout who was a surf sales rep who honestly was on the brink of being fired as a surf sales rep who went on to become a college dropout mental health expert, however that works, oxymoron. Uh, and so it makes sense that I wouldn't have all of the tools, that I wouldn't know how to do everything that's come with this journey. Uh, and. I sometimes joke, I, I've had two sabbaticals in, in our time as an organization. I got one for good behavior, and then I got one for bad behavior. Um, if you Take a sabbatical if you can, no matter how it comes. But the second one, 
our leadership team sat me down, and I didn't know what was coming. I didn't think it was anything scary. Uh, but they just they sat me down and just said, hey, you, you seem really unhappy. Uh, you seem pretty unhealthy. This doesn't seem to be working. Uh, and they were kind enough to ask me, what do you want? What do you want your job to look like? What do you want your life to look like? Gave me some time to kind of check out and unplug, time to go to counseling twice a week, to meet with some mentors, people who I respect and look up to. And it really was this season of, of soul searching and trying to answer that question of, man, what do I want? Because it had gotten to the point where I was just basically showing up and waiting for the bell to ring. And I had left my Hurley job thinking to write Love on Our Arms just seems like a dream. And so much of it was a dream. Uh, but I was bringing my own unhappiness, my own pain, just stuff that really wasn't even about my work at times, just my personal life being, I'm 39 and single. I aspire to not be single and, and just kind of bringing this longing and these questions to work. Uh, and at times, just I think taking my pain out on other people, just realizing I was, I had become really good at giving this advice publicly on Twitter, on Instagram, on college campuses. And I've had to learn it's a, it's a whole different thing to take the advice of actually being remotely healthy, of actually practicing self-care. Uh, and so I ended up sitting in counseling twice a week, and that's become once a week, and just having these really honest conversations, talking about my depression, depression, talking about uh, a lot of shame, shame as a leader, shame uh, how I've navigated relationships, how I've been difficult to work with, and trying to kind of rebuild different habits and, uh, and, and then taking a big shift, a big change in direction. I'm not the CEO, I'm not the executive director at our organization, went through a big transition. I'm, I'm so thankful that I still get to be involved. I still have a seat at the table, but it looks different. Uh, technically, I'm an independent contractor. I'm not there every day. I'm not at the office all day, five days a week. I come in and out. There's a lot of independence. There's a lot of freedom. I had a, a conversation with my counselor a couple days ago just talking about, she said, basically, I think you're, you're really afraid of screwing up again. She hears me talk about, about Gracie, this puppy, and I, I tell her I'm afraid of screwing up. It is good to not want your dog to poop at Starbucks as like a, a baseline. But she said, I wonder, I wonder if that applies to your work. I wonder if you felt like you, you kind of failed at working with a team. And so now you don't, even, you don't even revisit it because maybe you feel like you lost the chance. You feel like you'll screw up again. You don't want to let anybody down. And so now you kind of live in this, this weird limbo exile. And, and that felt really true. And, and she challenged me, hey, what would it look like to, to kind of lean back into that and to believe that it's possible to change, to believe that it's possible to be healthier, uh, to believe that you can be a person that can figure out how to fit inside a team. And yeah, I just, I think I got comfortable telling people that people need other people, that it's okay to be honest, that we are designed to be known and loved, to be in relationship, to have a community, to have a support system, that if you struggle with depression, it's okay to take medicine for it, it's okay to take an antidepressant. And it's, it's, it's easier, it's, it's, I can stand up here and almost appear to be vulnerable, or maybe it is kind of this calculated vulnerability, but it's a whole different thing to be in relationship to let a few people actually know me, right? Unless you're sort of protesting, no one's gonna talk back at me in this setting. No, no one's gonna ask hard questions. I get to kind of dictate how this goes. And so actually being part of a team, actually being known, actually at times trying to figure out what does it even look like? What does it mean to lead people? I think that's the stuff I'm in the middle of. I, I don't have it all figured out, uh, but it feels good to be honest. And I don't just mean this morning, but to try to be honest in my life, to try to be one of my favorite things. John Foreman from the band Switchfoot is a hero of mine. And, and he just talks about 
the goal of being the same person off stage as on stage. And certainly we all have different stages, whether it's a staff meeting or social media or an actual physical stage. Uh, and I feel like I'm a fr I get to be friends with John and he is that guy. He is the same cooking eggs in the kitchen as he is uh, leading his band on a stage under lights. And so I'm just, I'm in the middle of that and it's a work in progress trying to figure out not just how to encourage everyone else to be healthy, to prioritize mental and emotional health, but to figure out what that looks like in my own life and, and, and to be willing to walk through kind of that dichotomy of uh, really needing the advice that we give. I get to be part of a town hall this afternoon where there'll be more space for questions. I'm here with a couple people from our team, Amber and Brittany, and we have a merch table outside. Would love to meet you guys. Thank you so much.